Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll tell you a little story about uh, a guy who was the president of the United States. His name was Lyndon Johnson. So Lyndon Johnson became president when uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. And then he was uh, president during all the civil uh, rights movement. Uh, there was a lot of protests. There was a lot of riots. It was a really a dramatic time. So one day they interviewed him to write his biography. And they said, Mr. Johnson, with all this drama in your life, with all this turmoil, with all this protest, with you know, the world going uh, to pieces, how did you maintain your calm? And he said, you know, I had a little secret. Every night before I went to bed, I'd look at myself in the mirror and I would say, Lyndon, things could have been worse. You could have been a mayor. <laughs> so anytime you have a drama in your life, you can always find calm in the fact that uh, you could have been a mayor and things could have been worse. But jokes aside, um, does this work? Oh, yeah, that's me when I was, uh, when I was one, and I have a son who's one. Um, but um, I wanted to share a little story about why mayors are important, and I'm so excited that this is such a matchmaking opportunity between young people um, and mayors. And the story, the story goes like this. Let's see, where do I point for the PowerPoint? Do I point here? Can someone help? Yeah, someone is coming to help. Ah, you don't have my PowerPoint. Oh. Can we pause for two minutes because they are really fun slides? Yeah, um, yeah they do? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so I'll carry on with another, uh, with another joke. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> So I come from Albania. Do, how many people have been to Albania? Okay, a few people. How many people know where Albania is? All right. Well, you know, for a small country of 3 million people, um, I run a city which is the capital of Albania of a, of a million people. So a third of the population uh, lives um, in the capital. It's 30 times uh, the size of Wolfgang's uh, city. And the question is, if the city is 30 times uh, just, as, uh, just as big, and we have the same budget, 120 million. You know, how can you do a lot of the things with a small budget? So we'll talk about that. But there's a lot of power in small places. Uh, did you know that Mother Teresa is from Albania? Is Albanian? Did you know that uh, Rita Ora and Dua Lipa are also Albanian? They're from Kosovo, but from you know a small nation called uh, Albania. Uh, did you know that um, uh, the Blues Brothers, John and James Belushi, they're also from uh, Albania? So you know, don't be discouraged. <laughs> if you come from a, from a very small place, because small places can produce um, a lot of talent. But um, the joke uh, in the, during the Cold War, when the country was um, very isolated, it was called the North Korea of Europe. So it was, uh, it was um, a communist dictatorship. Uh, you'd get shot for going out. Are we good to go? But I'll still carry on with the joke. <laughs> and you get shot for coming in. So he's extremely isolated. And there was this uh, Simpsons episode. I don't know if you've ever watched The Simpsons. Um, and Bart is behaving very badly. And, you know, they have this troublesome child, so the, the Simpsons want to try to correct him. So they go and see Principal Skinner in the Springfield High School. And they say, you know, what can we do about our naughty child? And uh, Principal Skinner said, we have this exchange program. And, um, you know, when they go in this exchange program, they get to see other cultures, so they behave. So they send him to France for this exchange program. And then they tell Homer and March, the Simpson parents, they said, but there's a trick to this project. You send your child away, but you also have to receive a child. So they received this guy called Adil Hoja from Albania. And this is a little communist guy, a little pioneer, one of the youth uh, pioneer leaders uh, of the Communist Party. And he comes to Springfield. And uh, Homer is very tense because they're trying to figure out, you know, what does this Albanian look like? You know, does he have a tail? Does he have horns? And, you know. So uh, Homer is trying to get educated. And he asks Lisa. Lisa is the inter intellectual child of the family, of the Simpsons. So, and she's also playing the saxophone, like Wolfgang said, with the instruments. So Homer says, what should I know about Albania? And then Lisa said, well, you know, Albania has this very scary symbol. It's a double-headed black bird uh, as their national symbol. The second thing you should know, their currency is called the lek. 
And the third thing you should know about communist isolated Albania is their main export is furious political thought. So, so I want to talk about some of that export today. And this is, uh, this is my first day of work. I became mayor five years ago. And I opened the window of City Hall and I saw this. This is my job description. You can tell it's a concrete jungle. People have built everywhere. They come from an isolated uh, communist past. Things collapse. The Berlin Wall falls. All the, the regimes in Eastern Europe uh, fall down. And then people are moving to the large urban centers. And because people are moving to such a fast pace, then they're building also at such a fast pace without waiting for cities to give permits. So a lot of illegal construction. So when I took that picture, uh, the first picture, uh, and I was one year old, the city had 200,000 people. When I became mayor, the city had a million people within a very short uh, time within my life, uh, my life memory. And then I looked, um, I looked down and I tried to cross the street from, uh, from City Hall. And it looks like a mess. You know, previously we didn't have cars because in communism we didn't have private property. So we had 200,000 people and only 17 cars. Only the heads of the political uh, establishment and the army and everybody else just walked or rode a bike or got on a bus. But then with capitalism, cars became like trophies. If you wanted to show your neighbor you're not a poor communist anymore, you come to Germany, you take a Mercedes, you bring it to Albania, and you show your neighbors, voila, I'm rich now. I don't need uh, to be remembering the past and the poverty and the hardships of communism. So rather than being a transport from A to B, when A to B is very far away, it really uh, became a trophy for sh short distances, mostly to show off uh, to your neighbors. And then we had um, a little problem. Where do we begin? So I was sworn in as mayor. I saw this mess in front of my window. And all the media is saying, where do we begin? And I said, you know, for so many years, I've been frustrated because next to the city hall is the clock tower of the city, which was stuck for many years. It was 5.37. So we only got it right two times a day, 5.37 in the morning and 5.37 in the evening. But a good city cannot only get it right twice a day. You should get it right all the time. So we wanted to give a message. And I said, look, so I said, what is the most important project? What is the thing you're going to build? And I said, I'm going to fix the damn clock tower because... <laughs> I'm frustrated that we can't exercise authority three meters from the mayor's window, let alone build playgrounds in places that are 30 kilometers uh, from, from downtown. And then, because I was sworn in in August, I said, you know, what is the first thing that uh, will come up in our agenda? The beginning of school in September. So we had one month. And, you know, one of the advisors said, Mr. Mayor, don't worry, because in the kindergartens, we, only, we have a lot of space. We have 30% ocup uh, occupancy. I said, we have 70% empty space. How come? What do they look like? And we went to see what they look like. And they look like prisons. And they look like places that no one ever wanted to go. So a city of a million people with 300,000 children has 70% empty kindergartens because they look like jails. So then we said, you know, how are we going to build it? How are we going to fix it um, in one month? And how can that uh, be done? First, we started knocking down everything illegal in the territory of children's property. And I think that is very important to, to claim that the city is on the side of the weak, not of the tough guy with a Mercedes who builds a garage in the courtyard of a, of a school or of a nursery or a kindergarten, but the muscle of the state and the, the authority of the state, including bulldozers, police, is on the side of children. And first reclaiming their property before anything else. And then I said, if a city of a million people, like Tirana, produces half of the economy of the country, should it not also produce half of the charity, half of the generosity, half of the solidarity? So for 100 buildings that were completely uh, falling apart, we produced 100 files and we invited the 100 top companies. And I said, we're going to play a game. Have you seen that extreme house makeover when they take a really rundown house and they record it for one month? I said, we're going to play extreme house makeover but now with 100 children's institutions. And the company that will, get, uh, will do it first and will do the best job with the jury will get some city award. 
But, you know, everybody wants to be nice to the mayor. So if you are a mayor, use your authority. You have a lot of leverage to get people to do stuff for free. And then you can pay the favor later. But if you need, if you have an emergency, you have no budget, this is the best way to move forward. We went from 70% empty kindergartens to now 11 applications for one place uh, in a public kindergarten. The best compliment I've received for this work is when I meet parents who are saying, I am wealthy, but I want to take my kid out of a Montessori private kindergarten to send them to the public kindergarten. I think that's the best compliment one can give to public management of children's institutions. And then we started introducing play. My Lego friends are here, so we have a lot of Legos. We're one of your best clients. Um, and then we introduced this concept of urban farming. So this was the area where we were knocking down that garage for a Mercedes that the tough guy in the neighborhood built. But now we're growing food, and then we also have rabbits and dogs and cats, so kids can also learn how to live with nature within this urban jungle of the city that we, uh, we found out. And then we sort of said, look, kids don't stay in nurseries and kindergartens forever. What do they do next? They go to school. So high-quality infrastructure and buildings for schools and for kindergartens and for nurses are very important. Now, I meet a lot of people who tell me in the very beginning, I said, oh, but you're an upcoming politician. Why are you spending so much time with kids? Kids that don't vote and kids don't pay taxes, right? So as politicians, you're, 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 you think that the average, uh, you know, the people you need to carry about is the people who go to the ballot box and the people who get a, a tax receipt. Well, the question for mayors is, do we only worry about the next election or do we also worry about the next generation? I think if you worry about the next generation, you've also taken care of your next election. But if you're worrying about... <laughs> if you worry about only the next election, you totally miss out the next generation. And I think the, the Daria and some of the, 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 uh, the young people here said it right. I said, you know, we have ideas, we have thoughts, you know, we are, we are the present, we're not the future. If you say you are the future, it's a way to sort of escort them out of the room and sort of say, come back later. Uh, when I was uh, a kid, my favorite movie was Back in the Future or Return to the Future. Now that I think about it, in the movie, the future was 2015. So the future that we grew up with is already the past. And that's why I think it's fantastic that we're talking about kids as, uh, as the present. And then we started introducing the concept of sports and these 24-7 schools, and I'm not going to stop there because Wolfgang really mentioned it, but the thing about Albania is in 1967, we banned religion. We were the first legally atheist country in the world, and it was part of this cultural revolution that happened in Asia and China. So in one year, the Communist Party destroyed all the churches, all the cathedrals, and all the mosques. So the only institution of social gravity was the school. So we thought, look, if the school from our immediate past is our social cathedral, let's, me, let's build the best schools. Instead of them looking like prisons, let's build these super designed schools. So like you, you mentioned, you know, Frank Gehry and Zaha Hadid and Stefano Boeri and Bjarke Ingels, we invited some of the best architects in the world to build these social cathedrals called schools. And we saw this great experiment in Medellin, Colombia. And if you've seen Narcos, maybe you shouldn't see Narcos, maybe not all your age... Uh, is up for narcos, but you could see that there was this round down neighborhoods and the mayor of Medellin said, look, in the neighborhoods, in the bor boroughs, in the barrios of the narcos of uh, Escobar, we're going to build some of the best schools because it's the only way we can heal from that past. And we found out that the only way we can heal for our troubled past was build schools. Now, this is an interesting story I'll show you. And... Uh, I don't know who was the first that came on stage who said, leave politics out. Leave politics out of this work with children. And I think it's a very smart word because when politics get involved, we get some ugly stuff going on. So I'll tell you about this story. We decided, look, kids go to school, kindergarten, nursery, but what do they do after school hours? Do they need to play? Is play an important part of our life? Best, our best memories from childhood come from play, right? So I said, where do kids play? If we have 300,000... Young people, where do they spend their time? In a concrete jungle. So we said, why don't we build the biggest playground in Eastern Europe and turn this into a challenge? The reaction we got from our political opponents was this. They were fighting, tearing down the construction site, and uh, my team was very upset and very discouraged. 
Because we could have never thought in our worst nightmare that building a playground would get so many people upset. We get members of parliament who bring their gun to the protest and fight with our local police uh, to destroy uh, the construction site of the playground. And it was a massive hysteria. But, you know, one thing I have learned in this job, never be impressed by a loud minority. There's always silent people out there who are supporting our work. Maybe they don't have time to be agitating every day, but never lose sight of the silent majority only because a, a loud minority wants to block things and wants to stop stuff. So we said, look, they destroy, we build. They destroy, we build. They had 78 protests in a, in a playground that we wanted to build for 100 days. And they said, Mr. Mayor, we want a referendum. I said, let's have a referendum on opening day. And it looked like this. And the silent majority appeared. The silent majority sh came up. And it was not only kids, because you know the magic of uh, playgrounds is that kids bring their parents and bring their grandparents, and the grannies are knitting, and the grandpas are playing domino, and they're keeping an eye, crime is falling down, there's 24-7 life uh, in the city. So we took that to the next level. We said, not only we're going to build this great playground and many others, we're going to build one every month to really make a point because, as they say in English, you have to put your money where your mouth is. If you say you're child-friendly, show me the money, show me the budget, show me the projects. So we decided to, to build one every month. And funny enough, in 50 months in office, we were able to build 50 playgrounds which have become epicenters of public, high-quality life in our communities. <laughs> now, playgrounds, playgrounds are fun. But how do you solve the big problems that I showed you in the very beginning? Playgrounds, people say, are acupuncture. Although I believe I'm a big fan of acupuncture. If you cannot afford a full body massage, a little needle that touches a nerve will do just fine because it will tweak your whole body just like we did the warm-up in the very beginning. So acupuncture is great, but you know, it doesn't touch the whole body. It doesn't change the whole logic of, uh, of the city. So how do we solve this? Now that we have this coalition of kids, who don't vote, who don't pay taxes, but who are radicals and revolutionaries, then now we are ready to tackle some of the big challenges. So you remember this picture, I'll show you from the very beginning. And then we said, look, what if we shut it down for one day and we have a car-free day? And, you know, some of my advisors were saying, no, we're going to have a revolution. People are car-obsessed. I said, I know they are, but they've been car-obsessed in other countries and mayors have received threats, but in the end it has worked. Let's give it a try. So we gave it a try. We shut it down. And then we found out that in a place where people were claiming there are no kids, kids came from nowhere and started filling the streets with bikes and rollerblades and roller skates. And then we said, look, let's do it one more time, one more month. And many people were saying, no, 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 Mr. Mayor, it was a PR disaster. Did you read all the Facebook statuses, everybody you know, calling you terrible names? And I said, I know. But every time we do this, parents are upset, but these kids go home to the dinner table. And when parents were saying horrible things about the mayor, these kids were saying, but dad, do you remember the bike you bought me five birthdays ago? I never got to use it. This was the first time I found space in this busy city to use my bike. So then it started to change. And we said, look, let's do it every week. Let's give it a try every week. And then they said, let's do it every weekend for two days. And then people started doing yoga in the place which was the epicenter of cancer and pollution. And the reason why I say pollution for, for cars is because if you're an adult, my height, by the time the fume comes from the muffler to you, it's already dissipated. But if you're a child in a stroller, and if uh, you are this high, then it's right on your face. So car pollution is particularly critical for children. If you are a medical student or a doctor, you know that children breathe 40 to 60 times a minute, while an adult like me, 20, maximum 30, if, it, if I'm too excited like now, times a minute. So the amount of breath, but also the amount of pollution is much higher uh, for kids. So I think when we treat pollution, we should be triple, quadruple, extra alert when it comes to children. That's why we're applying a few ideas from uh, the Bernard Van Leer Foundation and the Lego Foundation, a few other great ideas, called Urban 95. How do you design a city from the height and from the sight of a 95 centimeter human being. Because only when adults see, like uh, some of the young people were saying, 
the cities from the height of a child and from the eyes of a child, then you can do better city design. So then we saw people having yoga. You know, who, who could have imagined downtown Tirana you could have yoga? And then we started playing sports and doing this occupation. And then we went permanent and we uh, designed this square with some of our uh, very good um, um, architects. And if I can make this the turn, this would be fantastic. Uh, and this is what it looks now. So from a, a downtown where 120,000 cars a day, we counted them, uh, were taking turns to decide where to go next, we turned it into a place with 120,000 people a day. And I think the ultimate question for mayors is, why are we designing cities? Are we designing cities for cars? Or are we designing cities for people? We started having these focus groups with parents. And we asked them, what is the most important thing in your life? They really answered like they were UNICEF employees. The most important thing in my life is children. Bravo. If... <laughs> but the follow-up question is even more important. And we asked these parents in these focus groups, if you agree that children are the most important thing in your life, would you agree that you put your money where your mouth is? That means you spend most of your budget of the family for the child, right? Oh, Mr. Mayor, don't offend me. Of course I do this. I said, well, let's do a little calculation. So we did a calculation with our focus group. We found out the average family was spending 32% of the income on the car and only 20% on one child. These parents were shocked. They find out that they were claiming other values, but they were living with other values. And they felt betrayed because they felt as if some dark power had changed their values without asking their permission. So it's not only about this infrastructure uh, in the squares and in the streets. It's also about a special infrastructure. And when I get asked what is the most difficult infrastructure to build, I say it's 10 centimeters from here to here. That is the most difficult piece of infrastructure a mayor uh, is able to fix. Because this is where our dogma, this is where our values, this is our stereotypes, this is our paranoia, this is our skepticism. And I think we should care, uh, and I think these events are very help helpful, not only about the physical infrastructure that looks pretty, but about the 10 centimeters between our ears, which are the most uh, difficult piece of infrastructure to change. And I think there's many mayors out there, like Wolfgang, who are also working on changing this type of mentality. So then we said, from being the epicenter of lung cancer, how can we turn this downtown into an urban garden? So we ran Europe's largest transplantation, just like you do an organ transplant, we do the tree transplant to bring them and cover our whole downtown area with trees. It was the largest a tree transplant operation in uh, Europe in 2018, and we also won the number one award for the best public space in Europe in 2018, a project that was only done and was only possible through the advocacy of children. So never underestimate the power of a child in a dinner table convincing their parents to leave the cars out and turn downtown a complete urban park. So, This is what it looks now on most uh, evenings, and uh, it's a really fun place to be, so if you come and visit, um, I'll definitely show you. But in Europe particularly, but everywhere in the world, you know, I saw Andrea from uh, Thailand, I remember when I, I was in Thailand. Food is important. Nutrition is important. This is our fuel, right? So where do we eat? How do we, how do we uh, train a generation to be healthy, to eat healthy? When I was a little kid uh, at 10, I lost my father through... A, uh, an illness, and I had a four-year-old brother and a widow mom uh, that had no money. So because my family of my father was poor, instead of giving us money after his death, they brought us a lot of dried figs because they came from this fig region. So by the time we were done with the funeral and 40 days of mourning, I had half of my room was full of figs and these fig boxes. So I decided to go and sell them in the market and became an 11-year-old entrepreneur to, to, to make some money for helping my mom. So as mayor, I went back to the same market, and he hadn't changed. So for 25 years, it was the same place. And we, we said, look, we really need to change this. And then again, the same loud minority. And don't tell me they don't exist in your country, because I am dead certain they do. And they're all the naysayers, the, the people that hate everyone and everything. They hate change. When you run for office, they say, uh, politicians say, who wants change? And everybody raises their hand, because change is so exciting, right? 
But then when you get elected and you ask people, the same people, okay, now, who wants to change? Everybody puts their head down because they want the other people to change first and they are more difficult to change. But it, it is like this everywhere. Everybody loves change when it happens to other people, not when it happens uh, to you. So then we started with this... Uh, I'm going to develop arthritis by the time I'm done. <laughs> and then we started this, uh, uh, this uh, process of change. And these people who wanted to, to keep things the status quo, they said, we want to keep our tradition. So let's have a debate about what is tradition. And many mayors who are changing things for kids are confronted by these con conservatives who want to keep tradition. And I said, is tradition to sell in the mud, in the sewage, in the sludge? with the rats, how is this our tradition? With asbestos, how is this our tradition? So we need to confront uh, these loud minorities. Not forever, I am a big believer if try storming, we have so many people who do brainstorming, but try storming is really nice because you try something, it doesn't work, you try something else. You don't brainstorm yourself to death for years to make a decision. So we said, look, let's give it a try and see if it works. Uh, so we did give it a try and <laughs> Uh, we went from this to this. And all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden we say, look, we can use the same space, but if it's beautified, and if we teach kids to eat healthy, and if we teach them the basic notions of hygiene, and if we teach them that this space can be a 24-7 space where they can come and play, where they can have musics and concerts, and they can draw, and they can have their birthdays, and they can uh, see this as a part of a community, then eating is not just a, a habitual stuff that happens three times a day, but it's part of a city experience. And then we started this really exciting program in which we're teaching kids to take food from home. Parents are lazy these days. You know, they want their iPhone to raise the kid, or their iPad to raise the kid. They want uh, Coca-Cola to raise the kid, or... Uh, Cheetos uh, potato chips to raise the kid. So they give them five euros. They say, look, go and have your break. And we're trying to change this. And by telling them how food is grown, where food is sold, and how healthy food can really make a difference, we're not preparing the next, the next client business for diabetes patients. We are actually preparing the healthy generation um, of the future. So markets are important. And marketplaces, particularly in areas that have such a strong culture of food, like the Mediterranean or Asia, are particularly um, important. And then during the nights, we celebrate events and we have parties. So if the local school has their, with their instruments, wants to come and have their recital, you know, they can do it in the public square for everybody to come and see and their parents to take, uh, to take pride of. Um, then I want to talk to, the, I know we have some architects here and some city designers. So I want to talk about design equality. Everybody pays taxes. Well, except for children, but every adult pays taxes. Which means not only car owners. B people on bike pay, pay taxes. People who walk pay taxes. People who get on a bus pay taxes. So if everybody pays taxes, why 95% of public space, which is called roads, are taken by the auto owners? Why 20% of the taxpayers owns 95% of the space. Something is wrong with this design. So we said, what if we did one experiment? We build one boulevard in this completely squatted area, but we build it with the principle that we give everybody the equal amount of space depending on the taxes they pay. So if you are an auto owner and you are 20% of the population, the taxpayer, then you only get 20% of the space. You don't need to get 95%. So we wanted to run this experiment and see what would happen. And this is what we found out. Let's see if someone can help me here. All right, so we took it down. And then this is what it looks like when you design with people in mind. And all of a sudden, people went to their respective places. So the walkers, who are the large part of the population, had the large amount of space. And all of a sudden, a round down boulevard, where no one wants to go and treats it as a city landfill, becomes one of the most exciting places to go for an evening stroll because design is done proportionally <laughs> with those who pay the taxes and who actually should, uh, should matter. Um, now, I wish this thing was going a bit faster, but please bear with me. It's actually so exciting that sometimes people take over the car space. And we have so many people that they're actually taking over the cars. 
And I think designers and architects in this room have a lot of power. Mayors are great political spokesperson. They are great communicators. They help. But I think designers also matter. And if you design with this equality in mind, then we can really have top designs in our city uh, that uh, can change things around. I want to move very fast now with a few small examples. Um, so a good friend of mine, I was telling Andrea, Stefano Boeri, he's this great guy, he's an architect, um, who built these two buildings in Milan called Bosco Verticale, which means a vertical forest. And they are beautiful buildings because they are carbon neutral. And I think design and carbon neutrality will be major topics uh, of the future, including uh, the topics that are being mentioned by climate strike and all the climate uh, movement. So we said, what if we can change this project for, to cover the entire city? So we went from the vertical forest to the orbital forest. Now in this day and age, we have a lot of people talking about walls, walls to keep immigrants out, walls to divide countries. We also want to speak about walls, but green walls, permeable walls, linear parks in the form of these green walls of forests, which also signify that we don't want to sprawl, we don't want to kill all the agricultural land, we want to contain. So we said, look, how are we going to build 2 million trees? How are we going to plant 2 million trees by 2030? We're a poor city. We have the same budget of a city that is 30 times uh, smaller. How are we going to afford all these trees? And then again, children, the best revolutionaries and the best radicals. We said, what if we ran this game again, run a city game, that every child plants a tree for their birthday? What would the city look like if everybody celebrated the birthday with a tree? So in our first year, we <laughs> in our first year we planted 100,000 trees. In our second year, 127,000 trees. In our third year, 150,000 trees. This is our fourth year, and I think we were able to do with kids adopting a tree, finding with a GPS location where the city intends to plant this tree, taking the tree. We give the family ten choices. So some trees cost 5 euros, some trees cost 150 euros, small trees. They know exactly where the location uh, will be. The tree has a name, e either their name or someone else's name. They bring their cousins when they come to visit town to come and meet their tree. During the drought, they come with a bottle of water and go and water their tree. So we went from the metaphor of putting roots in the city to the physical action of putting roots in the city. Because I believe if a kid plants a tree with his own hands and his own family celebrating it, he will never or she will never cut a tree in their life. They will never throw trash. They will never spit. They will never yell. Because I think people don't do these horrible things in a place where they belong. In a place where you don't belong, you throw trash. You urinate. You vandalize. You do graffiti. But in a place that is your home, in your home we don't do these things at our own home. But if a city becomes your home because you've planted a tree, it has an, a fantastic metamorphosis of everybody's psyche and their connection uh, to the city. So I would encourage every city to do this. If you look at some fancy stuff and you say, my city cannot afford, every city can afford to plant trees. And every family, whether it's 5 euros, 150 euros, can afford to plant a tree uh, for their birthday. And then how do we use technology? There's no denying. We can act like saints here, but there's no denying. Kids are on their phones every day. But there are some smart ways to use it. Uh, you know, with UNICEF in Tirana, we are putting everywhere in the city child-friendly Wi-Fi when we have these uh, filters uh, through the Child Friendly Foundation uh, for, for Wi-Fi uh, that allows certain websites or certain websites that promote violence uh, to stay out of the system. And you can safely surf the internet in many public spaces in Tirana uh, by using this Wi-Fi. And then we developed some of these apps which are a bit like games. You can see the cameras on the city. I said, look, why should the mayor have the monopoly of every camera in the city? Every kid should be able to see what happens in, uh, in the city. So they go to this little app, but the really cool thing about the app is that kids and young people, particularly teenagers, can report things. They walk down the street, they see a missing manhole, they take a picture, it has a GPS location, it will go to a little laptop in our office, which immediately will send it to a team that will go and replace the manhole. If it's a broken tree, or uh, something was knocked down from the storm, these kids will take a picture, it has a GPS location, we'll go to our little laptop, a team will go and fix the tree or fix whatever was broken from, uh, from the storm. So I think there are smart ways to use technology. It's utopian to say kids should stay off their phones. I mean, look at, look at us now. A third of us are on the phone as we speak. So, 
So let's not expect higher things from kids that we expect from ourselves. But I think there are smart ways to use technology. And I think with UNICEF Albania, we've done some pretty amazing reporting and um, IT uh, developments. Now, I can go on forever, uh, but one thing that we should worry about that I wanted to, to, to mention is these kids will not be kids forever. They will grow. What skills do they have? Now, when I was growing up, they were saying, oh, we should learn how to make automobiles. We should learn how to make, uh, to build stuff. But now we're in the fourth revolution. It's not enough to speak German and French and English. If you don't speak Scratch, if you don't speak PHP, if you don't speak Python, if you don't speak Java, and I'm talking about computer languages and the skills for the next generation. So I think we definitely need to upgrade our curricula. And mayors have a flexibility, unlike central governments who have to, you know, they're like big oil tankers. It takes forever to make a change, like 18-wheel trucks. But mayors are like bicycles, you know, they can make changes. So mayors can have the ability to prepare young people for the skills of the fourth revolution, which is the technological revolution. So we decided to turn the best piece of real estate completely round down. It was meant as a mausoleum for the dictator. Uh, if you are kids here, you know what a mausoleum is, where they keep uh, dead bodies of brutal people. Um, so and then it became a disco, and then it became a NATO headquarter, and then we decided to turn it into the largest IT learning school, city-based, when kids can go after school hours and they can learn how to code, how to animate, how to do robotics, how to do mechatronics, how to do uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, and all the skills that we need for this century. So I would encourage the mayors to also explore. I know education is not depending on the mayor, central government, but for some of these alternative schools, preparing kids that they transition from kindergarten, nurseries, to schools, to play, to public space, to also becoming future young professionals for our cities and towns. Thank you very much. Um, it was exciting to be here. Sorry for the PowerPoint. But... Thank you. But to conclude, to conclude, a few, a few uh, a small wrap-up. Uh, and I, I was reminded by this bike uh, thing. When we started doing these bike lanes, people were saying, Mr. Mayor, we're not Holland, we're not uh, Denmark. And I said, of course we're not Holland, we're not Denmark, we're Albania. I know that much. But Holland was not Holland and Denmark was not D Denmark 50 years ago. Look at old pictures of Copenhagen, look at old pictures of Amsterdam. It has to start somewhere. So if you are in Africa, if you're in Asia, if you are in Latin America, if you're not in Northern Europe, let's say, and people come up with this excuse not to change, then tell them this, show them all stories of Northern Europe where they realized that it wasn't because of the lack of money uh, to not buy automobiles, but because it was a lack of space. And I think they had to make these tough uh, decisions. So first, it can work, and it can work with a very small budget. Second, don't pay attention to a loud minority that will always be against everything you ever do. Third, never underestimate the power of non-voters, non-taxpayers, but revolutionaries called children. Thank you very much.